Uh, we're talking this week again about good faith estimates um, and that that portion of the No Surprises Act that absolutely applies your practice. A couple of weeks ago, uh, we, re, we shot the video and, and told you and explained why this good faith estimate portion does apply to you when other portions of the No Surprises Act don't really apply to you. Um, and then and then last week we talked about uh, who actually gets it. Now remember, it's a small portion of your of your patient population. Strongly encourage you to check out those videos on our YouTube channel and that way you know exactly what's happening there. Uh, it's important to understand both of those factors as you look at this. But the bigger question is really, okay, so what is a good faith estimate? And so how, what are the components? What does it have to be? Can I just tell them? Uh, can I go over it to them? Can I just put it in my own form? And, and the answer to a lot of these things is really no, um, because you know, whenever the government gets involved, know that, that, that they're going to detail exactly how you have to comply, right? And so first of all, uh, the, the thing to understand is a good faith estimate is very, in regards to the No Surprises Act, is specific to the patient that is making the request for a good faith estimate. So uh, know this, it has to be specific to them, uh, their condition, their treatment plan, and the services that you anticipate to render. And so there are specific elements that they have identified that must be included on the good faith estimate. Let me give you a short list. Now, this is not everything, uh, but these are some of the key components. Of course, because it's specific to the patient, it's got to include their name. It has to be, it has to have a list of all reasonably expected services um, uh, for that scheduled visit, uh, the one that they're actually scheduling at that time. And it has to include all of the prices. You have to include both the CPT, uh, the CPT codes, as well as the ICT-10 codes. Both of those are going to be important and must be on there. Now, I'm going to pause real quick there because some of you are going, but Mark, if this is a new patient, we don't have an ICD-10 code. That's fine. What you do include then is you would put a TBD. It's to be determined because you have never seen that patient. You can't include an ICD-10 code uh, in there, but in order to comply, you can add a TBD. Whatever you do, don't have your staff guess at what that ICD-10 code is because they don't know. You haven't even seen the patient. That would be rendering a diagnosis. Um, uh, without ever even seeing the patient, that would be a serious uh, potential challenge to uh, the standard of care. And so you put TBD, and what that does is it tells anybody who looks at that form that you did make a good faith effort on that good faith estimate to include all the pertinent information. Now, once you have made that diagnosis, then anything further must have the ICD-10 code as it relates to the diagnosis code for that specific patient. Anyway, CBD codes and ICD-10 codes must be on the form. Patient provider identifying information that includes your NPI. Uh, you have to have the appointment date if they've scheduled it. Now they can ask for a, a good faith estimate even if they're not scheduling an appointment that, it, that enables them to be able to, to, to look at a couple of different uh, places that they may want to go and receive care from. And then uh, there's also several disclaimers that have to be included. Um, and in those particular cases, you have to include those disclaimers on the good faith estimate. Now, what else? Um, it does not have to be on a specific form. So you don't have to use the governmental form um, or the one that they provide. It's about nine pages long, and I'm not joking. Um, you don't have to use that one. There's other ways to consolidate and be a bit more efficient with your paperwork. Um, in fact, if you visit uh, iocairo.org slash GFE, that's iocairo.org slash GFE, you'll see our full article on the good faith estimates. Um, go to the very bottom of that and you can see some downloads. One of those downloads is a template that you're able to use uh, in your practice. You can modify it to, to fit. Make sure if you're removing an element, it's not one of the required elements. Um, most of the items that are on that form right now are the required elements for the good faith estimate. So that's it. Now, it also must always be in writing. In, in other words, what they indicated was, although you can provide an oral description and an oral good faith estimate, um, in order to satisfy the law, you must get it in writing. So it must be done. Now, when I say in writing, I want to make sure it's clear. It's not necessarily that you're handing them a piece of paper, um, but it has to be in a form. If you provide it either through their patient portal or maybe through email, um, they have to have the ability to be able to download and print. So they have to be able to save that form and print it. Um, that is a requirement that they have placed inside of the No Surprises Act for the Good Faith Estimates. So, um, although, again, you can give it orally, but it must be in writing. And again, it can be done electronically as well. Now, um, those are the really the biggest things and the most important things to understand. And when it comes down to the actual good faith estimate and what it is, 
Again, if you haven't checked out the previous videos, that's going to be really important for you to have. Um, and please don't be deceived. This does apply to your practice and patients are experiencing this as they're scheduling with other providers in your area. And so this is going to become more commonplace um, pretty much every single day as more and more uh, uh, medical appointments are scheduled uh, by your patients and, and when they come and see you. So hopefully this helps you out. We'll catch you next week.